Good morning this Sunday morning. Trust this finds you doing well and good health. We miss you being with us and are looking forward to uh, just being together again. We've had some great services and we're, we're trying to, to social distance and, and do the things that we need to do. It's always a challenge, but uh, God is protecting. God has given us uh, great times of worship together and uh, it's really awesome. And we're glad to have you join with us today. It's a delight to open God's word together. I'm glad to be with you and uh, thank you for joining with us. We're in the Gospel of John today, John chapter 18, and we're continuing now as we move towards the cross. Jesus has spent the evening with his disciples. Now Judas has, has betrayed him, and it's all moving forward very quickly. And we learn uh, so much about ourselves. We, ser we learn so much about Christ, our Savior, as we look at how he models to us how to love, how to love unconditionally. And that's, that's really what we see here. So we're in John 18, we're in verses 12 through 40. We've got a chunk today we're going to look at. Uh, truth of consequences, uh, just, just the element of truth and the impact that it has on our life. In what ways that we respond to it and the impact of that. We're going to see that. Last week we started uh, at the beginning of chapter 18. We were reminded as Jesus came out of the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed this prayer. He challenged the disciples. He said, watch and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. Because that's right here, it's right around the corner. He says, I know your, your, your spirit is willing, you're willing, you desire to do the right thing, but he, he reminded them, your flesh is weak. What we see here is the willingness of our Lord. In fact, that time of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, not only was it a time of uh, a communion with he and his Father, it was a time of receiving strength again from the Lord, strength to, to uh, continue to do the will of his Father, to stay the course. And we see that here as he finishes he prays, not my will, but, but Lord, your will. And we're seeing the personification of that commitment of our Savior as we uh, go through these verses and we see this narrative that John gives to us. So we have the Synoptic Gospels. They all give you different information. We're seeing John here this morning give us a, give us a set of information that's going to give us a, a real clear picture of, of Jesus Christ ultimately as our Savior and as the one who loves us to the very end. And so... Uh, we are reminded here as Jesus comes out of the garden, as he moves forward, he's, he says to the religious leaders who have now met with him, who, well, actually who have confronted him in the garden, who have arrested him, who have seized him, who have bound him, he says to them in Luke chapter 22, he says, you know what, when I was with you every day, I was there all the time, day after day in the temple, he says, you didn't lay any hands on me. He says, this, this is your hour and the power of darkness. He is affirming that they are in control under the sovereign hand of God. This is the hour of darkness. Jesus is stepping into the hour of darkness. He's doing it willingly. He's placing himself into the point of, of greatest testing, of greatest unconditional love, of sacrificial love for us. He's stepping into that willingly because he loves us so much. So we're in John 18. And I want, us to, I want us to catch a couple of different elements here. There's kind of there's three elements here we're going to look at this morning. And so let's look at those together. The first one, the first scene that we see is, is uh, Jesus is brought to trial. He's brought to trial by the Jews. We have that Jewish element. And so let's pick it up in John 18. And uh, let's see that first element, beginning in verse 12. And so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and they bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. So Annas, Annas originally is the high priest. High priests from the Old Testament were given that role for life. That was the role of Annas to carry for life. However, Rome had other plans. Rome didn't like having power consolidated in one man for such a long period of time. So Rome mandated that they, be, that they change their high priests. And so Annas was forced by Rome to step down from that position, and other high priests stepped in his place. What we see from the scriptures and from, from history is that, is that five of his sons became high priest, and his son-in-law, Caiaphas, also became high priest. And so there was, there was, a, there was a lot of power concentrated in his family, he was still respected. He was still seen as, as high priest, even though there was another high priest that was functioning under the, under the authority of Rome. And so uh, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. 
So Caiaphas, his son-in-law, his high priest, and it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. One man should die for the people. He says, if we're going to survive under Rome, one person needs to give their life for Rome, for Israel, and it's going to be Jesus. He had no way of knowing that he was completing prophecy as he, as he gave that, that Jesus would be the sacrifice for Israel. He didn't understand that what he was saying uh, for the political expediency of, his, of, of Israel was ultimately a uh, prophetic word of the spiritual provision for Israel in Jesus Christ. And then we pick it up as we continue in verse 19. And the high priest then questioned Jesus, that's Annas, about his disciples and his teachings. And so he takes the time, it's, this, is an, this, is, uh, this is an informal interrogation, that's what we have here. It's illegal, technically, because under Jewish law, it was the high priest who was to carry out these, these trials, these interrogations. He's no longer functioning as high priest, even though he was in that role and should have had it for life. He, was, he had to step down. And so Rome recognizes Caiaphas as the high priest, not Annas. So technically it wasn't his place or authority to take up this role. But he does this, this evening, he takes up this role. Verse 20, and so Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. And I have said, I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. He says, ask anyone who's been with me. Ask any of these here who maybe have seen me. Ask the disciples. Ask anyone. I've done nothing in secret. When he had said one of these things, one of the officers, that would be the officer of the high priest, or his officer, standing by, struck Jesus with the hand, an, an, open, an open slap, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? That goes back potentially to Exodus 22, 28, where we're not to... We're not to, uh, um, to curse or, or to ridicule a ruler of God's people. Jesus responds, he answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Jesus did no wrong here. He didn't ridicule Annas. He simply said, there are those who can speak to the question that you gave. He says, if I've done anything wrong, speak to the wrong. Well, of course, they can't speak to the wrong because there's no wrong, there's no sin, there's no evil to speak to. There was none committed here. Jesus simply gives an honest answer, not a rebuke of Annas, per se. And so Jesus, Jesus uh, just says, what you want to know, it's out there. Everyone, anyone who wants to speak to that can speak to that. And so we see here that Annas brings Jesus here. He's bound. He, he brings him into a line of questioning. And Jesus is struck. He's hit during this time. We also pick it up in verse 24. Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So here's what's happening. It's evening. Jesus is in the garden. He's bound to the garden. He's brought to Annas. Annas gets first shot at him, an, uh, an illegal shot, to interrogate him, to try to set the stage, to try to gather evidence uh, for his guilt. When it doesn't work, he sends him to Caiaphas. Now, the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, place the, the questioning of the evening at the house of Caiaphas. So it's quite potential that Annas is either visiting with, with Caiaphas, potentially even living with Caiaphas. It could have been a, quite a large place that where they live together, they're a family. He and his sons and his son-in-law, that wouldn't be uncommon at all during the time. And send him across the courtyard to another place, to where Caiaphas is. And so as Annas is doing this, Caiaphas is, is gathering together the people that he needs because in verse 28, 24, he sends him to Caiaphas, the high priest. It's evening. And so there's, there's a real sense of urgency to get um, this trial done, this interrogation done, before the Sabbath comes. And so they're, they're hurrying and gathering people. So there's probably a gathering of people that's taking place while Anna starts this process. 
and he sends him over to Caiaphas. He's bound, and so and so John John doesn't spend time on this element that he's with Caiaphas. Uh, not really. Um, so John spends most of his time on on his time with the Roman officials. We're going to see that in a minute. But here in verse twenty four, what what takes place is this, there's more there's more questioning. There's informal. There's a time of of specific interrogation against Jesus from Caiaphas. There are false witnesses that are brought in. They contradict one another. They can't get they can't get Jesus to the place of guilt. Finally, in finally, finally well, we're going to see what happens here. And so they 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 interrogate him, and and uh, what they need is to come to a conclusion that he's guilty of of death. And so this is where. It's where it's picked up from John 11:50, where Caiaphas says, "It would be better for us if one man died for Israel." That's Jesus, and in all this time, Jesus is is fulfilling his word. He's protecting his disciples. He's not releasing information about his disciples. He protects them and covers them. And then we see in in verse 28, and then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters, and it was early morning. So this goes on all night. This whole, this whole time of interrogation goes on all night. And it's morning time now. And the morning, the purpose of the morning is to bring interrogation. It's to bring a, a condemnation. And so they try to gather, gather the evidence, but they can't do that. Okay? And, um, and, they're, and so, finally, so finally, they gather together in the morning, and they're able to come to a conclusion. They... they well, we see it in Mark chapter 14. They ask a question. They ask a question point blank to Jesus because they've, they've, got, they've come to a dead end everywhere they've tried to go. The, the false witnesses haven't been able to agree that and they've not been able to gather evidence that's conclusive against Jesus Christ that could bring him to death, a death penalty. And so they ask Jesus Christ the question, are you the Christ, are you the Son of God? Mark 14, and Jesus said, I am. There we go. Ego, Amy. The sound, the response of deity. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. That's at the right hand of God. And coming with the clouds of heaven, I'm coming back in victory. And, and when they hear this, they, the high priest tears his clothes. They cry out, this is blasphemy. And they condemn him as one deserving of death. And so he says, yes, this is, it is as you say. That's how he answers the question. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? He goes, yes, it is as you say. And, he, and so he affirms their question in his answer. For according to the Old Testament law, from their point of view, they, he has affirmed um, that he's guilty. He's guilty of blasphemy from their eyes. And so they have the death penalty. But before we move forward, we need to know, go to another, another element here. During this whole time, the disciples have scattered. But we're going to see another element here, which you know the story well. But I want us to pick it up and I want us to read it. Okay? And so we see Peter. We see the fall of Peter. Okay? Verse 15. And so Simon Peter followed Jesus. He's following Jesus. And so did another disciple. We don't know who that disciple is. It's possible it's John here who's writing the text. But it also says in verse 15, that disciple was known to the high priest... John didn't necessarily have a relationship with the high priest. It didn't necessarily have to be one of these 11 disciples. It could have been Nicodemus or someone like that who was, a, who was also a follower of Jesus Christ. We're not told ever specifically who this disciple is. And so Peter and this other disciple are following Jesus. Remember, Jesus told the disciples, don't follow me. Not tonight, not when I leave. Peter goes, uh, another disciple comes. And verse 15, and he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, into the courtyard where Annas is, or living, and where Caiaphas lives. And so they're in the courtyard there, and uh, Peter stood outside the door. So he's outside. He can't come in. The other disciple is able to go in. And so the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. He can come in. I know him. I vouch for him. He can come in. And so maybe, maybe, maybe the disciple leaves. Maybe he's standing there. I don't know. So Peter comes in, verse 17, and the servant girl at the door said to Peter, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I'm not. 
No, I'm not his disciple. And now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire. It's cold out because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. And Peter was with them, standing and warming himself. And verse 25, and now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. And so they, they said to him, now those who were standing around, they said to him, see, they're, they're looking at Peter, and now there's more than one that's wondering. They said to him, you are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it. He said, I'm not. In the Greek, it's emphatic. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. One of the servants of the high priest, verse 26, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. Uh-oh, and then there's trouble. So he's a relative of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Peter took his ear off. Jesus healed Malchus. This relative is there. This relative is there. He looks at Peter. He goes, you're the guy. He says, did I ever see you in the garden with him? He's expecting a yes answer. Peter again denies it. And at once a rooster crows. Here we have the denial of Jesus Christ. Jesus had prophesied this. Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter says, I'm not. Peter does that. Luke adds this to the element. See, Peter, Peter, Peter should have never been there. The disciples should have been together, praying, gathering strength, giving strength to one another, standing together. They, they scramble, they run, they're terrified. Peter decides to run along. He goes to the courtyard. He's, he's, he's walking there, walking with them, following the proceeding. Then he's standing by the fire, and then and we're told in another gospel, he sits down with them. And you, know, you get that sense of, of uh, Psalm chapter 1, we're not, we're not to walk, stand, or sit in the council of the ungodly. He just keeps moving forward. He keeps putting himself in greater danger. He should have fled. He should have left. There's Jesus, but he doesn't do it. How do we know Jesus is right there? Well, because look what Luke adds to us right here. Luke says this, And so when the, when the rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked right at Peter. You know, we all know the we all know the, the feelings that we have when we get the look. You know, the look from a parent. It's because we're in trouble. It's because they care. Because they're trying to grab a hold of our behavior or attitude or whatever that might be. They're sending a signal. And Jesus looks. And I have to believe here that the look he sa sends to Peter is not condemnation. He didn't come to condemn. He came to... He came in chapter 13, verse 1, he came to love these men, these disciples, and to love them to the very end. And I, and I have to believe here completely that what, the look that Jesus gave to Peter was not one of, you're worthless, and I'm so disappointed in you. I have to believe the look that Jesus gave to Peter was one of absolute love. Remember, Jesus is being interrogated. Jesus is being uh, ridiculed and, and, and mocked, and and yet he turns and he sees Peter in the courtyard. He's probably on the edge over here. And he's being interrogated. And, Judah, and Peter's watching this whole thing. And he sees Jesus and he says, are you his disciple? And Peter goes, no, I'm not. How can he say that? I don't know. How do we do that? How do we fall into such a place ourselves where we just turn away from Christ? And Peter looks and he, and, and he sees Jesus. And Jesus looks right at him. And Peter remembered all that Jesus said that he was going to deny him three times and he went out and he wept and he wept bitterly and and there's Peter just crushed there's Peter destroyed there's Peter remembering the look of his Savior right here and how do you handle that how do you handle that failure he's betrayed he's betrayed Jesus Christ he's betrayed his Savior that's what he's done He says in another gospel, he says one of his surprises, they don't even know him. I don't even know him. And Jesus looks at him with love and, G and Peter's crushed. Peter should have fled, but he didn't. Mark 26, Matthew 26, 74. He says, I didn't even know him. Yeah. You know, when we... When we stand on the edges and we don't listen to the Spirit of God telling us to take a stand and be bold, and well, we don't identify ourselves with Jesus Christ. You know, we're a lot like Peter right here, just just standing there on the edge, standing there by the fire, 
not associating with, not identifying with Christ, and we have the opportunity, but we're afraid. You know, what's really neat here is, is, is this. Later on in John 21, Peter's got, the Lord's going to restore Peter back to a position of leadership. He's going to love him back into a position of leadership. That's what he's going to do. He says here, Simon, do you love me? He asked him three times. Simon is grieved that he asked him three times. And, and he finally says to Peter, as Jesus does, he says, feed my sheep. That's a position of leadership. That's a position of trust. That's a position of affirmation. That's a position of, of privilege. That's a, that's a position of opportunity and of authority in the, in the early church. And the Lord says, I'm going to use you, Peter. Be encouraged. You love me? Use that basis of love to feed the sheep, to flock, the church, build the church. Peter, I'm going to use you. And he says in verse 19 of that chapter, he says, you're going to glorify me. You're going to glorify me by how you die. But after he says that, he says, Peter, follow me. He, he gives Peter a fresh, brand new opportunity to make things right and to, start, and to start over. He gives him the second chance, as it were. He says, Peter, follow after me. Aren't you glad? You know, the Lord looks into our life and he just, he knows you failed. He knows so many times that I have just failed him. And yet he comes back to me with love and grace and he says, I want to use you. You're my child. You are still useful for me. You have an opportunity still in my hands of grace to be conformed into, to my image. I, I want to use you. I can use you. Let me take your failures and turn them into, into success that are beyond your wildest imagination. Let me turn you into a, into a trophy of grace. And that's what he does here with Peter. You know, Peter, Peter left that evening and he wept bitterly. You know, he's so different than Judas. When Judas just sinned, he wept, but it was, it was remorse. It was guilt over sin, but it wasn't repentance. He never turned to Christ. In fact, he went out and he took his own life. He hung himself, indicating he never had that relationship with Christ. Not the fact that suicide meant that he wasn't a child of God. What it means is it was an affirmation of everything that had been true in the life of Judas. He never was in relationship with Christ. Peter here, on the other hand, is going to be used by God. And then we come to the third scene. You know, Peter is broken. But Peter is used again for the Lord. And we come to this, uh, Jesus before the Pilate, before the authorities in Rome. And this is where, this is where uh, John spends some of his time, okay? John 18, 28. And so we come back to verse 28, and it's early morning. And so now it's morning, and the Jews have met in the evening. They've, they've gathered what, what they can of the Sanhedrin in the evening, and that group grows. And by morning, they're probably all together. And they come to the sentence of death. Now the, now the penalty for death in the Old Testament for blasphemy is stoning. Okay? But the Jews didn't want that. They didn't want to stone him. They want to humiliate, humiliate him as much as they possibly can. They want to place him under Roman authority and to have him crucified. They don't have the authority to crucify him. That is a Roman punishment. That is something they can't do. And so, and so they want to see him humiliated. They want to see him placed before the crowds. And so they go to Rome. They want, they want a public record. They want a public information. They want Rome to be behind this. They're technically not to, to perform capital punishment, but they have been given authority and lease at times when Stephen was killed and with others. Okay? So it's morning time we see here. Okay? And this is what we see. Look at, look at verse 28. <clears throat> they led Jesus from the house of the Caiaphas to the governor's quarters. It was morning. They themselves, they didn't enter the governor's headquarters so they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. So the Jews, this whole time, as they go to the, well, as they go to the house of Pilate, they go to his courtyard but not into his house. A Gentile, a Jew was allowed to go to the courtyard, be outside the house, but to go into the house would be to be defiled. It says here right here, they didn't want to be defiled, which which is so ironic. Here's here's the here's the reality of their condition. They're blind to their sin, they're blind to their reality. You know, they look at themselves and they and they and they view themselves as clean. Well, because we didn't go into Herod, into Pilate's house, we're clean. We're not we're not unclean as far as the law. We can participate we can participate in the Passover. We can, we can observe the, the giving of the lamb at Passover, which points to Christ. But we can do that today, and we can still honor God even though, we're, even though we're executing his son. You see what's taking place here? 
They're blind to their sin. They're blind to their relationship to Christ, to God their Father. They're blind to that. Sin has blinded them from that. Proverbs 21 reminds us, every man is blind. We're, everyone is right in his own eyes. That's where they're at right now. There's a way that just seems right to us. because When we're in our sins and we're blind to sin, when the sin nature has us in its control, we are in bondage to sin before we know Christ. When we're in unbelief, this is where we're at. And we're on a path that is to death, no matter how right it may seem to us. We may seem wise in our own ways, but we're reminded here in Proverbs 26, there's no hope for us. None at all for us. None at all. Look at verse 18. Chapter 18. So Pilate went outside to them. He goes out to them. And he said, what accusation do you bring against this man? What accusation do you bring? And they answered, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Now, that's not really an answer. They didn't answer the question. We're going to see it here in a second what the answer is. But they didn't answer the question point blank here. Kind of put Pilate just a little bit on uh, alert. And there's something going on here that's a little bit fishy. Okay? Pilate said to them, verse 31, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to them by what kind of death he was going to die. The kind of death they are seeking is crucifixion, not stoning. Okay. And so we see here the reality of this. They're blind to their sin and they're blind to their Savior. They're blind to the gospel. In fact, in verse 39 and 40, when, they, when they're given the opportunity, they, are, they, they say, let's release Barabbas, not Jesus. They want Jesus crucified. They're blind to the fact that the very Savior of the world is right here. They are standing in His presence. He's come out of love for them. He's come to pour out His life for them. He loves them so much. What they don't realize is there, there are those among their group that will potentially receive Jesus Christ after He rises from the dead. But they will be guilty in a unique way because they have turned over Jesus Christ to be executed before Rome. Now Luke 23, verse 2, kind of gives us in a nutshell what they found. They began to accuse Jesus. And these are the three things that, they're, that he's guilty of they, as he, they communicate to the authority here. Pilate and Herod, we found this man misleading our nation. Well, he hasn't done that. He forbade us to give, he's forbidden us from giving money to tribute to Caesar. He didn't do that. In fact, he, he did a miracle, provided money. And they said that he himself is Christ, a king. He is, but they put this in the, in the context of a political king. He's going to rise up and overthrow Rome. Again, misleading in their understanding. Isaiah 5.20 reminds us, Woe to those who call evil good. And, all, and the rest of that verse says, And light darkness. And the world, the world is doing that today. The world has always done that. In unbelief, we, we gravitate to those things which, which are against the, the heart and values of Christ. And the world today is gravitating to, to a, a worldview that is anti-Christ, is opposed to the ministry, the person of Jesus Christ. And so they reject Jesus Christ. Why? Because of 2 Corinthians 4, for the God of this world, that Satan, has blinded their minds, the mind of unbelievers. Here, the Jewish leaders, their minds are unbelieved, un or blinded. They just are not able to see part of the sovereignty of God. Some of them may come to know Christ afterwards when Pentecost erupts and the church grows and it says priests come to know him and leaders come to know him. And maybe some of those right here are part of that who said crucify him and were part of that decision. What grace. But right now their eyes are blinded. And the beauty is, is here in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. God says, let light shine out of darkness. That light that is shown into our hearts. When we receive Jesus Christ, when some of them down the road are going to receive Jesus Christ, that light is going to shine in their heart and they're going, to be, they're going to be crushed by the conviction of sin as to what they did. And they're going to be broken. That's what, that's what salvation does. It breaks us at the moment of salvation and it crushes us because of our sin. And then the love of Jesus Christ, it washes in and it just brings, it brings the perfect healing into our soul and into our life and it changes us. And our, we are flooded with grace. And in that moment, we know the peace of God for the first time. The conflict that we had in our souls about Christ 
and about our sin, it's washed away and we are at peace with God. And we know the peace of God. Verses 33 to 38. And so Pilate entered his headquarters again, and he called Jesus, and he said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? So he's with Pilate now. They take him to Pilate. And he says, Do you say this on your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own, your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my heart, my kingdom is not from the world. And then, and then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? either mockingly or, or a very genuine expression. We don't know. And after he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and he told them, I find no guilt in him. Jesus says here in verse uh, 37, for this purpose I was born and for this purpose I came. He was born, that, sh that shows his humanity, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. For this purpose I came, it shows the deity of Jesus Christ. We have the humanity and deity of Jesus Christ completely. And so in these verses here, we see this, they're blind to the truth. What is truth? What is truth? Jesus says, I've come, I've come to give witness to the truth. John 1, 4, Jesus Christ embodies all that grace is, all that truth is. He says, I've came, I came because I'm the author of truth. I'm the source of truth. I'm the giver of truth. He is this morning to your life. If you want to know truth about yourself, if you want to know truth about your future. If you want to know truth about your life right now, how to live it, what's the what's the purpose for your life? What's the mission for your life? What does God intend? What does He want? We need to look to Him for truth. You'll know the truth, and here's the beautiful thing: and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. It'll release you from the bondage, the bondage that sin holds us under, that these men right now are held under. He says, "Which one of you convicts me of sin? Can anybody convict me of sin?" See, no, you can't because I'm telling the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by, by me. He says the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's from the Father. When he comes, he's going to be the spirit of truth, and he's going to bear witness about me. He's going to touch your heart. He's going to touch your heart. And when he does, he's going to reveal the truth of God into your life, and you will see Christ with, with fresh eyes for the very first time. I trust that's true for you. We have an insurmountable need. We've, we have an indescribable Savior. We've been given the truth. How are we going to respond? The Word of God is our source of truth. The Word of God is, is the way in which we understand and learn about who Christ is. When we take the Gospel and we share good news, we're sharing from the power of the authority the truth of the Word of God. The Word of God is what changed your life. If you're in relationship with Jesus Christ, He is your Savior. It's because the truth of the Word touched your life. The truth of Christ touched your life. This is our prayer, right? It's expressed beautifully in Psalm 51. Create in me a, a clean heart, O God. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. That's the prayer. Maybe that first step of being restored for you listening is, is, the, is the step of salvation, of receiving Christ, of responding to the truth that you need a Savior, that Jesus Christ came to stand in your place, to take the wrath of God in your place, and then open His arms and say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe the, maybe the step is returning to the Lord in repentance, of confessing sin, and of returning to the Lord. Peter's going to have to be restored, return to the Lord. These spiritual leaders, the Jews who have rejected Jesus Christ, their first step is going to need to be responding to Christ in faith at Pentecost and beyond, of, of responding to the testimony of the disciples who, who remain ultimately strong and true and bold for Christ. And many will respond, and their first step will be salvation. But when he, when, when he does that work, when he pours the truth into our life, he restores us. He creates in us a relationship, a new relationship with His Father. Restores us 
He, re he restores the relationship that was broken because of sin. When we're Christians and we're out of fellowship, He restores that fellowship. He breaks, he breaks that wall down and restores us back to fellowship with Him. That's what He does. And here's what it does. This takes us back to our starting point. As we look at, as we look at this evening, Jesus is moving forward. That's what He's doing. Remember, He prayed. Lord, He says the Spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And so He prayed. And He prayed, he prayed for His own Spirit. He prayed for the disciples. And ultimately, His prayer was this. Not my will, but yours be done. That's what he prayed. That was his passion. That was his goal. And as he's going towards the cross, as he stands before, as he stands before Annas and before Caiaphas, and as he stands before Pilate, Herod wasn't even mentioned here, but Herod is Herod is also here. Herod says, "Oh, I can't wait to meet Christ. He's a miracle worker." And then when Jesus wouldn't answer his questions, he he had him beaten and he mocked him, and they and they would and they would beat him and hit him, and then they sent him back to Pilate. Because the Jews had said, he's a troublemaker in Galilee. He's trying to stir up Galilee. And so Pilate says, ah, there we go. I can get rid of this. And so he sends him to Herod. And then Herod sends him back. And it's back in Pilate's lap again. And so here at the end of chapter, chapter 18, that's where Barabbas comes into the picture. And he puts Barabbas out there as a potential. Maybe he can get rid of this problem. Jesus, have him beaten and then and released. And Barabbas can, can, can be the one who's executed. And, and, and so Pilate's trying to get rid of this. In the meantime, Peter needs to be restored. In the meantime, people need to come to the Lord to know the Lord. And so Jesus is praying to his Father, Lord, give me a willing spirit. May the Lord give us a willing spirit. That's what I'm asking. I challenged our people this last week to pray this prayer every day this week. Pray that we would watch and that we would pray. That we would, that we would uh, not succumb to temptation. In fact, that we would pray, Lord, my spirit may it be willing today. May, my, may I yield my will to you today. My flesh is weak, but Lord, here, here I am. I lay myself before you and pray that prayer every day and say, Lord, I'm willing. Lord, I'm willing today. Sustain me with a willing spirit. That's my prayer for you. Are you willing to let God touch your life? Are you willing to let Christ touch your life? To accomplish in your life the good that he wants to do. What a beautiful Savior. What a beautiful Savior. He's moving forward. He's being... He's been accused of blasphemy. He's going to be executed. He is guiltless. He is innocent. Sinless, the Son of God. He willingly placed himself into that position for you and I. It's only when we grasp that, it's only when we, in a fresh way, bring that back into our hearts, it's only when we view others who need the Lord through the lens of what Christ did for them, it's only when we view our service to the Lord in the, from the lens of how He saved us, why He saved us, that it changes us and it leads us to this place right here. Lord, I'm willing. Lord, I don't, I'm not strong. I don't, have, I don't have what I need. But Your grace sustains me. Give me a willing spirit. Sustain me that I might say this, Lord, not my will, but Yours be done. Lord, we are learning from Jesus Christ uh, by His example to stay true and faithful. We see here that our Redeemer is faithful and true. To the very end, He loved His disciples. To His very end, He loved us. He's loving us, as we saw in John 17. He's going to the cross. He's loving us. Lord, may we pray this prayer this week, every day this week. Lord, give me a willing spirit. Protect me from temptation. Help me to be, help me to be active in prayer every day that I might accomplish Your will. Lord, help us to that end. The first step of that is simply surrendering to You, that you might be our Savior. And then surrendering to you as a child of God to follow after your, your will in our life. God, help us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May God just bless you as you bring this scripture, his word, into your heart this week. We'll see you next week.